Hello, this is Jennifer Wu, Canon Explorer of Light, and join me behind the scenes for night photography and the Milky Way, and learn how you can take spectacular night images. So we're going to start off with learning various things. So we're going to go with equipment choices, what camera settings to use, how to focus, scouting locations, and then get into the creativity with increased creativity for the compelling compositions, light painting techniques, and composites of twilight and the night sky. And so for equipment, I wanted to mention that the cameras, any modern DSLR camera and mirrorless are going to be great. Older models work well. And in addition to that, you can have the really older models that might not have a higher ISO and I'll go over some processing techniques to make that possible. Wide angle lenses. With photographing the night sky, we want a wide angle lens that's going to give us less motion blur, more depth of field. We have a can use a faster shutter speed and we have less noise. And we want a wide aperture like f2.8 or 1.4 and that is going to allow us to get those stars as points of light because it's so dim we want to allow as much light into the camera. So for the lenses we want to check out the quality of the lens. So the resolution, the details, as well as looking at coma and vignetting, some distortions there. Prime lenses are going to have less of that than the fixed lenses. Here vignetting at f1.4 you could see quite a lot of darkening of the corners. But then when we go to f4 you could see that that clears up. And so one, that's one thing to consider when choosing a lens. And another is the coma. So the coma is those wings and tails. You can see them most in the corners of the frame. So check it out. This at f1.4, you can see a lot of those wings and tails. And then at 1.8, you can see it gets less. And then here at f2.0, it's even less, and 2.8, we hardly see it, and it looks much better now. Those are some choices. For equipment choices, some of the lenses I've used in this presentation are the 14 millimeter, the 17 millimeter tilt shift, the 24 millimeter tilt shift, the 24 fixed focal length, the prime lens. I really like this quite a bit. This is my favorite, but that's just personal preference. And the 11 to 24, the 8 to 15, and 16 to 35, and the 24 to 70. So those are the ones that are in this, but you can use any wide angle lens, anything, especially at 2.8 or faster is going to be great. And then some other things to consider are the 17 to 55 or other lenses that are for the crop sensor. This is for the full frame. So. Some equipment to bring with you, a tripod, and make sure it's sturdy because for 30 seconds you don't want any wind moving it, a remote release, or you can use your self-timer. I use two seconds because 10 seconds seems like a long time, right? And bring a red headlamp. So the red headlamp or a red flashlight that preserves your night vision so that you can see in the night. So when our eyes adjust to that dark light, then we can see easier at night. But if we expose our eyes to 30 seconds of a bright white light, then we are no longer able to see deeply into that dark night. So use the red headlamp so that you can see easier and see your camera better. And a loop is helpful as well. Then you can review your images and help use it for focusing. A compass, you can use your phone. That way you can find the Milky Way when it's at the south and you use the compass to find the south when you're out shooting a location so you know, oh, the Milky Way is going to be here. And be sure to wear warm clothes if you're up at higher elevations or in areas where it's going to be cold at night. Hat, gloves, jacket, and keep yourself warm, food and water. I also like a star focusing filter, so I use the Sharp Star too, but there's a lot of other ones that are out there and they have great directions on their website of how to use it. Or a filter for removing the light pollution, and this is breakthrough, but there's lots of others too. And then for cold weather, you also want to protect your camera because dew gets on the front element of the lens when it's cold. When I was photographing the auroras, I saw, I reviewed my images and they were blurry. And I looked around the front element and there was frost all over the front element of the lens. So to prevent that, um, 
put your lens hood on because as air moves across the lens, then that causes the dew to form. So lens hood on, a toe warmer or hand warmer. Toe warmers I like because they're easier. You could just stick them onto the lens versus a hand warmer. I tape them or uh, put a rubber band on. And then um, I would put that on the lens and on the battery pack of the camera or where the battery is located to keep it warm because the battery power dies down when it's really cold. So I keep the spare battery in my pocket and then I put a rain cover over the camera to add a little extra warmth so that it stays warm and I don't have any problems with the battery power going low or that the um, getting dew on the front element. If I do have dew, I'm going to use a chamois. And the reason for the chamois is because the lens cloth just smears the the, the water onto the lens and the chamois wipes it clean. So that's helpful to have. Up next, we have researching the shoot. So to find out where the Milky Way, the sun, the moon, and where they are in the scene. One of the easiest ways to do that is to use an app. One of my favorites is Stellarium. It's a free desktop app and you can use it to find the Milky Way. Just enter in your location, date and time, and then it will, you will get an image. In this image, you can see near Yosemite, California, the Milky Way is going across the sky and pointing to the south. So now when I go out into the field, I take my camera with me and I take some test shots during the day of the landscape as well as a compass and I find out where is the south and then I photograph in that direction because I want to get the Milky Way in it. And you can also look up other objects in the sky as well, so like the moon. And another one to use, photo pills and PhotoPills has the augmented reality. And for this, I would tilt it up to the sky and then I point it around and you could see what is going to be in the sky at that date and time of the location. I scroll forward to later on the evening and find out, oh, this is where the Milky Way is going to be. So I know that when I'm in the field later on, when I come back at night, this is the spot and it makes it really easy to use. I hit, like to hit the action button on the lower right hand corner because then you get a snapshot of it and you know what you're going to be looking at later. And here's an image at a location near me and you could see the Milky Way in the scene. And then the Milky Way, which is so beautiful. When I say the Milky Way, I'm talking about that dense galactic core, that thick area. Now to our eyes, the Milky Way looks like this white band of light going through the sky. It's often you see an arching through the sky. Uh, but the camera picks up more of the gases and stars than our eyes can see. While we only see a few thousand stars, there are 200 to 400 billion stars. We are just one point of light among many of our, in our solar system. It is so expansive and it makes me feel just so small and infinite at the same time. So look for that band of light across the sky when you're out. And then this is an image of the Milky Way. As you can see that dense core, that's where in those three arms, one in the arms all the way out and we're looking through that dense core. So, and that's when we want to get that thick, all those gases looking in that direction. So in January, we're looking the other direction, away from the dense core. And the sun overpowers that dense core during the day. So we don't really see the Milky Way dense core at all. Then we start seeing it more in February and by April and May, in the early morning hours, 1 a.m. in May, we then can see the beautiful arc of the Milky Way and that beautiful dense core. And then July, we got, start seeing it in the late evening. And then by um, August, we're going to see it more, uh, it comes up more vertically. And then September, we're seeing less of the core and we're going to see it right after the sun is set. And then October, just a little bit. And then it's disappearing again in the winter time. And those are like kind of the basics of what, when we will see it. In the northern hemisphere, we see it rotating clockwise, and in the summer, southern hemisphere, we see it rotating counterclockwise. And to photograph the new moon during the new moon is going to be ideal for photographing the Milky Way. And 
the light pollution is one thing we want to consider. So we want to stay away from cars, city lights, planes, and a fantastic resource is darksky.org. And they have a list of many of the places. My favorites are the national parks and the state parks because they're often very dark and it's nice to be able to go to some place where it's dark and you don't have to worry about too much light pollution in those areas and researching the clear skies for that. The clear skies, we want limited light pollution, so away from the cities. Deserts are fantastic here in Death Valley. In this image, you can see that we have beautiful light pollution in the background, but we also have um, beautiful clear skies. And the reason for that is because the air is very dry and that dry air is really nice to be able to get us clear stars. So even though Death Valley is at a lower elevation, we still get beautiful stars because of the dry air. And higher elevations will work very well too. So going up to the bristlecone pines and the white mountains of California or anywhere, getting up on those higher elevations, we get the clear skies and we get more of the Milky Way in that beautiful dense core. And also, of course, we want to consider keeping the going when we have clear skies, you know, for our landscapes, we want clouds and beauty. And then for night photography, we I'm often <laughs> clear skies, no clouds. And I'm checking the weather for that. So seven timer is fantastic. Seven timer and clearskies.com and space weather. And space weather is a bit more accurate than the average weather. And then the other ones allow us to see the cloud cover, the thin cloud cover and the high cloud cover. And that gives us a better of idea of what we're going to expect when we go out photographing. And here is a view of light pollution, of the world light pollution. You can see the dense areas in Europe and in the U.S. And here is a shot of the U.S. of the light pollution. And it is very dense, as you can see, on the East Coast. So for pollution, I'm going to tell you about all my mistakes that I have made through this presentation. And the reason I do that is so that you can learn from them too, and so that you don't have to make these mistakes and that you will then have beautiful images. When we're photographing, we want to get away from the cities, right? So I thought, oh, I'll go up an hour north of Denver, Colorado to Loveland, you know, over like 12,000 feet. It's absolutely gorgeous. We've got a national park right off to the side. I'm thinking this is going to be great. And I get there and this is what I get. Flat, dull, barely see the Milky Way, right? However, then when I go out to another location here in the Bristlecone Pines, these are both raw shots, unedited. You could see the Milky Way and it's gorgeous and it's beautiful. So what happened? When I was up at that higher elevation in Denver, I was looking south at Denver right into the light pollution. Yeah, not so good, huh? So it washed out the Milky Way and it didn't look so great. But yet if I go here in this image of Death Valley, you could see the light pollution adds to it and that it creates an interest. And Las Vegas is two hours away, but it adds an appealing feel to it. And it also, I like it, but just personal preference, you may not like it. And it doesn't bother the scene. It doesn't overwhelm it. So there's different choices you can make when considering that. Sometimes light pollution works on your favor. Here in Zion National Park and the Watchmen, you see the light from the town lighting up the mountain. It's perfectly balanced with the night sky. So it's great. You don't even have to light the mountain or you know do any light painting or anything. It's just done for you. So that's fantastic. And just enjoy the, the night. And this was shot at f1.8, 20 seconds, ISO 3200 at the, with the 24 millimeter. Up next, camera settings. And for camera settings, we want to go photographing the stars as points of light. And this is during the new moon when no moon is present in the sky. And we can photograph this a few days before the new moon and a few days after the new moon. And I'm going to go over two methods. Method one, where we take a single shot of the stars. And method two, where we take multiple shots, which reduces the noise to almost none. And so we'll go over both methods. With method one, we're going to go over photographing the lens, the shutter speed, the aperture, the ISO, and the white balance. And for our lens choice, we talked about that as going to be a wide angle lens. So anywhere from like from 14 millimeter to 35 or, you know, 
some of the cameras have wider, like 10 millimeter or even eight, so those are possible too. And we're going to do the, use the wide angle lens so that we can get that lower ISO and that will give us plenty of choices there of different lenses we can use. For our shutter speed, we want to use the PhotoPills app. And the PhotoPills app gives us two things. It has the spot stars and that has its default mode or 500 rule. And it also has the NPF rule. And so the default or the 500 is going to give us images which might have a little bit of blur. I find I use it maybe a little bit faster than that, but it's pretty close. And then the one that uses the MPF rule, that's going to be the accurate one, also called that in the app. And that is going to give you super sharp stars. And so what you do for the photo pills, you enter your camera, your lens, and it will give you your shutter speed. So you can decide on what your personal preference is there. For my preferences, I like to use the stars a little bit softer, I guess you could say, because when I enlarge it, you don't really, I don't find, you don't really notice them when you big print in your proper viewing distance. So it's personal preference. And now let's take a look at spot stars in the PhotoPills app. And you can see here with the EOS M50 Mark II as I entered into the camera, and then we have the 15 millimeter, and it gives us the shutter speeds for the MPF rule, seven seconds and 500 rule we get at 21 seconds. And then as we go to the R5, we see that the MPF rule is seven seconds again, but the 500 rule is now at 33 seconds. So just enter in your camera and your lens choice, and it will factor in the megapixels and give you a shutter speed that's appropriate. And you can choose the shutter speed that you like for that. And here are some examples of shutter speeds that I use on a full frame and a crop sensor. Now the 500 rule is one that people use and oftentimes they go a little bit faster than the 500 rule, but the 500 rule is you take 500 divided by the focal length of the lens and that gives you your shutter speed. So if you take 500 divided by 24, it gives you 20 seconds. And then you could use that and of course, always double check your shot afterwards. Now for the aperture, be sure to use a wide open aperture such as f2.8 or faster. If you are using faster than that, you're going to have some payoffs and that you will have less noise, but you will have more distortions and chroma. And for your ISO, you want to make sure you're on manual for taking these shots. And I prefer camera raw, however, you can use JPEG if you like. And then you want to set your aperture and shutter speed and then bring up your ISO to a good exposure. On a new moon at f1.4, that's gonna be 3200 and f2.8, 6400. So make your choice depending on what f-stop and shutter speed you are using. Now for the white balance is the Kelvin temperature. I like to have it blue. That's not natural, they, but I like it that blue tone. I think it's really pretty. And so I like to set the Kelvin temperature on the camera white balance setting between 3400 to 4400. I'm often at 3800. That's my default setting of where I go to, of where I start out. And another way to do that, if you don't have the Kelvin temperature, you can set it to the tungsten setting. That is the light bulb icon on your white balance setting. And that will also give it a blue tone, if you like the blue tone, of course. Then here is an example of the daylight setting. And you can see it's got a very brown hue to it. And here is at the 3800 and you can see it has a nice blue tone or 3600 and that gives it a nice look. So your basic settings for the new moon are is that wide aperture and that wide open lens, so f2.8. And then the shutter speed is gonna be based on that and your lens and your camera choice in the PhotoPills app. And then f1.4 at 3200 or f2.8 at 6400. And that gives you a beautiful exposure. Now, if you're going to be 
photographing like during when the moon is out and you've got moonlight on the landscape, what I do is I raise my f-stop and that gives less distortions or I lower my ISO for less noise. And then check your histogram. One of the things that I see in workshops is the underexposed image. And I think that is probably the number one thing that I see as a mistake. And when you look in the back of the camera during the night, you look at it and it looks great. The first time I was out photographing the Milky Way, I took a shot of the Milky Way. I thought, this is gorgeous. And then the next morning I look at it, it's a black screen. It's really dark because my eyes adjusted. I didn't look at the histogram. I just viewed the back of the LCD screen and thought, oh, I've got the shot, but I didn't, <laughs> right? So be sure to look at that. And you want to see that, make sure that you have image in that last two bars on the in the frame in the histogram so something that looks like this and it is going to give you a good exposure if you're only on that last quarter then the image is going to be underexposed on a new moon night so you want to have more exposure on that so that you don't have to lighten it too much because you can increase your noise if you lighten it too much so those are the basics for that method one where you get a single shot and then Method two is where you get multiple shots and you can reduce the noise. So we're going to use the same lens choice, the same white balance and settings there. However, our aperture, I use f3.2 and then six second exposure and ISO 20,000. That's going to be on a new moon. So if there's more moonlight, I might raise my f-stop so that I could get less of the coma and distortions because we don't need to reduce the noise because the software is going to take care of that. So take 15 shots and then combine it in the software. And there's two softwares that you can try out. The Starry Landscape Stacker, and that is with the Mac. And then the Sequator is with the PC. And that one is free. And those have, they have great demos on how to use them. So really easy to use. And then you stack them all together and the noise disappears like magic. Now coming outdoors, I wanted to go over how I would set up a Milky Way shot. Here we have the lovely evening light, but I came here during the day and I scouted out and I checked it out and I'm like, okay, I used the augmented reality in the app and there we go. And Milky Way around 10 p.m. So I know I'm gonna be focusing at this spot. And then I come back to the same spot and I know that I'm here because I've placed a rock on the ground. And now next I set up my shot and I've come of course with my red headlamp so that I can preserve my night vision and then I will be able to find my way easily and see easily throughout the night. And I go ahead and I set up and I set up my tripod and I want to make sure that it's really sturdy. So I get my tripod and set that up and get a nice composition going with that too. With the tripod, I want to make sure that it's super sturdy because you don't want any wind to blow over the tripod with that long 30 second or even six second exposure. And once it's set up like that, then I put my hands down to make sure that my area is steady. Put the camera on there. And now I set up my shot. I come over and I look and I find out where my focusing is and I want to make sure everything is going to be in good focus. So I focus on a star. I point the camera at a star and I set my focal length, which I've determined to be 16 to 35 and I'm shooting at 16 millimeter. And I zoom in digitally on the LCD screen, turning on live view. And now I manually focus. I can use a loop if needed and making sure it's sharp. Ah, but I noticed that I might want to have even an easier way would be to use a filter and you can use the, a star focusing filter and placing it over the lens and then you turn until you see the star become sharp. In addition, you can put extra weight on the tripod in order to make sure that it stays nice and steady. 
Now, once I have it in focus, I'm going to tape it down. So I have tape on my lens hoods. Now I tape it down. I make sure everything is in manual. I've got manual mode on, camera raw, manual focusing, and we're set. Now I'm going to make my composition. I tr look down. I want, don't want to have too much of the black space of the horizon line, and then I tilt up till I see that horizon line. There we go. That looks good. I level out the camera with the in-camera level, and that looks nice. And now I take a test shot. I'm going to set the aperture to f3.2, the shutter speed to six seconds, and the ISO to 20,000. And this is going to be for method two in order to stack the images later in one of the apps. And that will reduce the noise. And now we've got to take a test shot. I will do that now. There we go. And let's check that shot out. I review it afterwards. It's looking good. Now I'm going to take the intervalometer on, make sure I set my two second timer on. You can also use a remote shutter or the Canon Connect app. And let's do that now. And we've got the self timer on and it's looking good there. All right, I can set the intervalometer for 15 shots and those will be all blended together later. So there we go and that's it. One tip is when you are out photographing in the dark, you could be fumbling around, get familiar with your camera. Turn off all the lights, set all the settings for a night setting in your camera with the lights out without using a flashlight or headlamp or anything so that you're familiar with it so it goes quickly, smoothly, and easily. And then you're not frustrated or having to use a headlamp out there where you might be disturbing other people with their lights and their what they are doing. Next we have focusing. So whatever you focus on is going to be the sharpest. Everything else will have relative sharpness. So I like to photograph on the stars and the distant subjects because then the stars will be in good focus. And you can change your focal lengths at any time, but each time you change your focal length, you're going to need to refocus that lens. And after you focus, I also recommend just taping down the lens so that you can have it stay there and it'll be sharp and you then can move around and make different compositions without having to worry about it. Here is an example of a stars that are out of focus. And you can see they're blurry, they're soft, they look like donuts. So if you see this after reviewing it on your LCD screen, you want to refocus. And here's an example of stars that are sharp. And that's what you want them to look like when you're reviewing your images. And so we have several methods. The first one is to autofocus on the moon. This is the easiest and simply autofocus on the moon, then turn the autofocus off and tape down the lens. Another method is to focus on a far subject. I often do this either at night or with a large flashlight that is pointing at something that is dark and then focus on that and then do the same thing where you turn the lens autofocus off and tape it down as well. And the next method is live view, the third one. And this is the one that I use the most. So I just turn on live view. I point at a bright star in the sky and I put it in the center of the frame. I zoom in and then turn the lens or manually adjust the focus so that you get it nice and sharp and in good focus. And then of course, turn off any autofocus that you might have and tape down the lens as well. And here is the lens and I put tape on my lens hoods and I bring a little bit of tape with me and that way I can make sure to tape it down and then it's set for the rest of the night. You may need to refocus if it's a changing of temperatures, but for the most part, it should be fine. And you want to take a look at where that is for your camera lens and most 
camera, like most of my camera L lenses, they have the infinity symbol and then the L, and it's right there at the end of the L, usually somewhere in that area. And after you have done your autofocus, say on the moon or a distant subject, take a look at where that is, because when you tape it down later, next time you're doing autofocusing or focusing, you wanna make sure it's in that area, right? So if you notice that it's all the way into infinity, that it will probably be out of focus because the infinity is not going to be sharp for the stars. And the fourth method is to use a focusing filter. I use Sharp Star 2, and you can see on their website how to use it. it. They have really good demos. And then it works really well. You just put this over the lens, and then it aligns up with the stars, and you get a really sharp star, and it's super easy. So focusing has been something that people have struggled with in the past, and this is the way to make it easiest. Up next, we have scouting locations. And before we go out and scout, we wanna research the location and find out where the Milky Way is, like pointing to the south, and we saw that arc in Yosemite. And then I go out into the field, I bring my compass with me, I check out the direction of the south and to see where the Milky Way is gonna be. And I look at any foreground elements, like rocks, boulders, lakes, streams, something that I can place in the foreground. And so here in Bryce Canyon, I found these trees, and during the day, I took a snapshot. And then I went and got a rock, placed it there so that I could find my spot when I returned. And then I came back and I got this shot at night, and with the 24 millimeter, just like I did earlier in the day, but then I decided one wider. So I switched, I went to the 16 to the 35 at 16 millimeter, and I get more of that Milky Way in the shot. So I like that too. So I'm flexible. I don't always stick with whatever I've done during the day. And in this image of Yosemite during the daytime, we have the Milky Way, as I know, that's going to go in that arc from the south. And then when I returned at night, you could see there's the Milky Way and a little bit of a shooting star as well. And this was photographed at f1.4, 20 seconds, ISO 2000 at 24 millimeter. And in Yosemite as well, photographing during the day, I found some trees and photographed that. And imagine that star-filled sky behind it. And then came back at night and then got this shot. So I have that beautiful silhouette of the trees and then the beautiful sky above, filling the frame mostly with the sky and the Milky Way. Photographed at M1.4 at 20 seconds, ISO 1600 with 24 millimeter again. And up next, we have composition. So what is your dream shot? What is the shot you would love to get? Is the expanse of the Milky Way, the aurora reaching for the sky, or perhaps a shooting star? I love the shooting stars. And I remember when I was out backpacking with my dad and my sister when we were little, and he would carry everything, and we would be charged with carrying our water bottle and stuffy. My dad would try to herd us onto the trail as we'd be running off everywhere. And at night, we would lie down and we'd look up at the stars. And it was so much fun. We just loved it. And then when coming back from the Eastern Sierra in California, and we were lying out on the ground and pulled over from the car because there was a meteor shower going up and we saw tons of meteors. And it was just fantastic. And my dad told us, wish upon a shooting star. And we did, and I knew it would come true. And so now I have a wish for you, that you get incredible, beautiful, creative night sky Milky Way images. And all of those shots that you're dreaming of, let's see how you can go about getting those. So for making the compositions, we want creativity because just having the technique is not enough, right? We gotta have it stand out and be unique and different. So let's take a look at how we can do that with foregrounds and lens choice. And you can take a look at getting some unique foreground elements like rocks, boulders, trees, lakes, bodies of water, the ocean, and mountains, and then place those as your foreground element as interest for your scene. And then taking a look at different lens choices to make it creative and unique. And those two combined are gonna elevate your images so that they stand out amongst the snapshots that are out there. So here we have the 
beautiful expanse of the Milky Way, as you can see as it expands across the sky with the 15 millimeter fisheye. This is a very wide angle of view, so that's why we see it expanding across the sky, and I like that perspective. And then also, we get a little bit of air glow here. So air glow is when the gases are reacting with the solar flares, and we get that kind of greenish and purplish colors that you could see here along the horizon. It's really beautiful and nice. I like that additional color and pop to it. It adds interest to the scene. Now you can also see here is the barrel distortion. That's the curvature of the lens, and that's purposeful. So that's the fisheye lenses have that curvature look. Then in this image, it's the eight millimeter with the eight to 15 millimeter lens and at Zion, and you could see that kind of round look is from the eight millimeter. So F4, 25 seconds, ISO 64 at eight millimeter. This is again the eight to 15 at eight millimeter as well. At F8, 30 seconds, ISO 250 and photographing with the 17 millimeter tilt shift lens and using the 17 millimeter tilt shift lens shifted downward so I could get the foreground in good focus and photographing during the full moon. So consider full moon photography as well as new moon photography. And the full moon here you could see as a starburst. And then this happens by shooting at f16. If I was shooting at f4, it just is a blob in the sky. So I shot it at f16 in order to get that moon burst that you see here. At f 16, then 30 seconds at ISO 320. Consider putting the mood in your frame on purpose to create an interest. And my favorite, the 24 millimeter lens. Now the reason I like the 24 millimeter lens so much is that the 24 millimeter lens, it has a wonderful angle of view. So the Milky Way is a little bit closer. You see that dense core a little bit more. In addition to that, the mountains I think look beautiful. I love mountains. so. With the 24 millimeter, they're a bit more present. With As you go wider at 16 millimeters, they get smaller in the frame. So I like the look and the feel of it, so that's why you see a lot of those, but that's just personal preference. You might like something else, and that's just fine. Now, these are just my suggestions. There are no hard, fast rules here. You can do whatever you like. So I want you to expand your creativity and try out different things, because that's how you come up with those unique images. Be sure to try out different things. I was asked by Canon to get a unique photograph and I'm like, oh, I'm like, I was already scheduled out. I had like one day to go get it. So I ran out, I went up to the bristlecone pines, like a nine hour drive, but there was clouds, it was stormy, it was high winds. I got stopped by the police. They wanted people to not go any further trucks and were not allowed and then I'm just like hoping so I just kept going I'm like I'm just gonna go anyways and I get up there and I'm photographing just at uh, just uh, there after twilight after I've you know hiked out into the mountains and found a tree that I like that was unique and so I photographed it and this is what I got and then I went to light paint it right so I went to light paint it with the same flash that I was hiking around with and I got this shot and luckily all the clouds had cleared up just for a little while just after sunset the winds died down and I was able to get the shot and then I pull out my flashlight and nothing there was no light this is what I got so sad <laughs> But I had an absolutely fantastic time and at least I got that shot. So I was happy I was able to turn that in. They might have been expecting some light painting, but oh well. I did get them a second shot. So for that one, you could see here the same tree, but I moved around and I got down lower to the ground. So a unique viewpoint is to get very low to the ground, just a foot or two off the ground and looking up. And here that puts the tree up into the sky all the way up to the top of the frame making a creative composition to fill up that empty sky space so that's something to consider when you are photographing and this one another 24 millimeter i'm looking for bodies of water i found this lake however for several days it was windy and there were ripples and i couldn't see the reflections of the stars and then on this night it was calm and clear and i got the shot and i was able to get the reflections of the stars in the water so that makes it lovely to be able to get that so look for bodies of water on low wind nights 
And then another thing for creativity is to do panoramas. Now this panorama was five shots. And what I did was I used the tripod, the leveling base, and I shot them vertically. So I took five shots vertically. I overlapped by at least 30% to 50%. And that allows the program to do a little bit of adjusting, as well as I left edges more on the top and bottom and, and farther to the right and to the left than I needed so that I could crop it to what I wanted. And so that gives you a little space and wiggle room there. And then I photographed them all at the same exposures, no auto settings, like no auto white balance or anything like that, so that they would all look the same. And so I shot them at f1.8, 20 seconds, ISO 2, 1500 at the 24 millimeter and in sequence too. And then I put them together in Photoshop through Lightroom and then this is what it created. And this is Zion National Park, The Watchman. And to create that, I used the vertical. It goes the other way. Now, if your camera is not level, what might happen is you, you could see it goes at a panning like this. So you want to make sure you have it level. So what I use is a leveling base. If you don't have that, that's okay. You can still make it work. Just be sure to leave extra room. So I level it out with the leveling base here. So this is the leveling base. I happen to have really right stuff. I should be a little more careful. Uh, really right stuff. And then I level it out. And then when I tighten it, and then I turn the camera, it's level. And that way I'd be sure to get a nice shot instead of a pano of a mountain that goes up like this. Compositional tips that I recommend. What I like to do is take the camera, point it down, and then put it back up so that I don't get too much empty black space. I often see that when I'm leading workshops is the foreground has just got nothing in it. So I'm just like, okay, just tilt your camera up a little bit as I'm reviewing images during the night so that they can be sure to fill up the whole frame with either the sky or the foreground. So I'll have like a third of the foreground and two thirds sky or the opposite, two thirds foreground and one third sky when I've got a big foreground that I'd like to fill up. Another thing is often uneven horizon lines. I see that often. So use the level in your camera to level it out and review the image afterwards because sometimes you have a lake or a mountain that is at an angle and level doesn't actually look right. So it might look better to be off centered just a little bit. So just adjust it as needed. Take a shot and then recompose because you want to do a test shot, see how it looks and review it and you think to yourself, is it a print? Would I put it on the wall? Does it look great? Right? And if you get no, then recompose until you get the shot that you want. So that way you can make sure that your shots are just as you want them. And another element for making our compositions is using light. And so at night we have the moonlight and moonlight adds to our creativity. Here, moonscapes that are lit by the moon. The full moon is very harsh light. The moon has a strong light, harsh shadows. You can also check the apps to find out where the moon is in the sky so that when you go out, okay, oh, the moon is gonna be here. So directly opposite, you're gonna have that very harsh light. So this is an example of that. This is in Yosemite at El Capitan at F4, 20 seconds, ISO 1600 at 15 millimeter. And you can see the very strong light here. And then this is creates that more moody light also in Yosemite, but this is the crescent moon that's off to the right of the frame and it's just about to set. And so you could see that it's providing that nice soft light through the frame and it's kind of a hazy light, but I like it because it provides atmosphere. So use the light when there is a crescent moon to create some interest in the scene. And that was shot at F1.4, 20 seconds, ISO 500 with the 24 millimeter. And then this one is the, by moonlight as well at Patagonia. And there was a crescent moon 
but it already set. So by the time I was able to get out, the crescent moon set and there's just a little bit of ambient light and you can see that there's not a lot of light. It's a really quite dark image. And I photographed this at f2.8, 25 seconds, ISO 6400 with the 2470 lens at 24 millimeter. And now you can see I just put a small amount of the lake in the foreground, then the mountains and then the sky to give that layering effect and create the composition that way. And I just like the soft light of this and I think that works quite nice. Next we have light painting. This is so much fun and I love it so much. So this will elevate your images and bring them to the next level for when you see light painted mountains or buildings and foreground elements. And for the light painting, you can use many different light sources, candles, lanterns, glow sticks, strobes, LEDs, headlamps, sparklers are fun too. One thing to consider is the color temperature. So because we are taking the color temperature from daylight and shifting it to blue, at least that's what I'm doing, and it's not natural, but I like it, and then we can imagine that all of the colors are now going to shift to a blue. So you can see on the color wheel, red goes to magenta, the green goes to cyan, and yellow goes to neutral and then to blue. So I like using yellow because it gets a more neutral color and makes it look really pleasing and nice. And I like that warm tone, it feels good. And you can use whatever colors you want, of course. And the household flashlights are often warm toned. The Krypton Xeon halogen lights are warm toned. LEDs and headlamps are often blue. And um, then you also have light panels and they can be a single color or they can change in different colors. So the light panels are fun to use and you can light a large scene. Some of them you can control how much output it has. So that way you can get it very dim because a lot of times we don't need a whole lot of light and then you could also control the color temperature with those and that makes it really fun to be able to do that and then you could have different colors in your scene. So there are no real rules here and you can just do whatever works, take a test shot and then adjust from there. So what I like to do is about three to five seconds then for a tree. Um, if I have a very low light, I might be 10 seconds. For a whole building, I'm using 10 seconds or so, and depending on the, you know, the power of your light source. And then um, for distant mountains, I'm using a larger flashlight and panning it throughout the scene. Here, photographing in Bryce Canyon, and you could see the cliffs are dark and they're silhouetted on a new moon. And f1.8, 20 seconds, ISO 4000 at 24 four millimeter. And then here with my headlamp just behind the camera, you could see it's very blue light and very harsh light. And then I went off photographed with a tungsten household flashlight. And you can see this provided a nice warm tone and I like that look even better. But to take it up is to get off camera. So go to the right or to the left. I don't know why, but my light painting is always from the right. You'll notice that. And um, you can go wherever you want, just get off camera. And if you go into the scene, wear dark clothes and bring something to hide it so that you don't hit the camera with the flashlight. So I'll you know, just bring a card and just light paint like in the scene wherever I'd like to. With this one, yes, the, you have that nice shading. So it's bright onto the right and then dark on the left so that Wonderful shading provides texture and depth and interest to it. So just get off camera, take the flashlight someplace else. And here when scouting, I went to Yosemite and during the day I found these trees and I was looking up and I took it with the 16 to 35 and I thought, oh, this is good. But there's this empty space in the upper corner. So then I got out the 24 millimeter and this is the shot I got. So you look up and now I've filled up the frame with the 24 millimeter and I like that better. Then I went back at night and I got this, but it was very dark. As you can see, the trees with the silhouette didn't look very good because there were so many leaves, they really just blocked up and it didn't look appealing. So silhouettes of trees with fewer, fewer leaves, branches are gonna look a lot more appealing, right? And so I thought, well, I'll light paint it. So I light painted it, but it looked really strong, harsh. It was near the camera. I, and you could see this very harsh direct light. So I didn't like it so much. Then a car went by and I thought, okay, well, I'll just wait till the car goes by and it's now ruined this image. I looked at the image on the screen and this is what I got. I'm like, oh, I like that. It's moody. It's got that soft light. Ah, 
that's it. So now when I take workshop participants here, we take a Brickman flashlight, Q-beam, and I point it, it's well, just a large flashlight, and I just point it sideways, and here are the trees, and then the ambient light fills it all up. And so it gives it that soft light without having to point it directly at the light, and it gives it a unique look. So consider doing that with a large flashlight. And this was shot at f1.4, 20 seconds, it's ISO 6400, with the 24 millimeter. And then photographing at the bristlecone pine trees. You know, I love photographing there. It's beautiful. And took a snapshot of this tree during the day. Then I returned at night. I had left a rock in my spot and I came back. And then I shot this one at night. And for here, I used just a regular household flashlight. And then I put my favorite softening technique on, the air sickness bag. So those barf bags you get at the airplanes, you put one of those on, and then I painted with light with that, and that gave it this soft, moody look instead of that harsh, direct look. And off to the side, again, to the right. Then uh, Ghost Town, Rhyolite, Nevada, photographing there um, during a workshop that I was leading, and we light painted here the building for 10 seconds, and also the interior, wearing dark clothes, and then taking that red headlamp and painting the interior as well. And this was photographed at f2.0, 20 seconds, ISO 3200 with the 24 millimeter. This was photographed at Mono Lake. And Mono Lake is just beautiful. It has these tufa and then we got the Milky Way in the background and it looks beautiful. And the tufa go into silhouette and then using the air sickness bag and a Roscoe warming gel over my flashlight. I light painted this and went off to the right and then did, just did throughout the frame here and then a little bit more on those farther ones that were back. I aimed it there a little bit longer to kind of even out the light source. So that's the 16 to 35 millimeter at 17 millimeter f2.8, 25 seconds, ISO 6400 around the new moon as well. So those are some fun techniques you can do with light painting. Just remember to move away from the camera. You could go to the left if you like and have fun with it and try out different things as well as different colored gels or light. Do you want to create magic and magical images? Up next we have composites where we combine twilight with the stars. So let's go over twilight and that magic hour and photographing that and it is where we have that transition from day to night and the beautiful qualities of twilight that we will combine then with another image later it has that soft light it's kind of blue or pink and it's very appealing it has low contrast beautiful colors here's an image at twilight that we have with the belt of Venus, and, and that is the Earth's shadow. So opposite the sun, you will see at sunset or sunrise, you will see this belt of Venus, and it's that beautiful pink light on the horizon line in the Earth's shadow. So take a look for that to photograph it, to include it in your shots. So when is twilight? In the U.S., the contiguous U.S., we will find that about 45 minutes uh, before sunrise or 45 minutes after sunset, and that's that beautiful blue light hour. And then farther away from the equator, you will get twilight in the Arctic, you know, 24 hours a day, of course, or nightlight at all in the equator, about 20 minutes, so depending on where you're at. And then this shot is with at twilight, but using it for two minutes, and then that allowed to get that wonderful look of the movement of the clouds going through the scene. And be sure to scout your locations for twilight so that you can get that great shot. So looking for the image that you want, and so go out and scout. So I went out in Iceland, but I forgot to scout, and this is what I found. Road closed, and this is how I felt about it. So. Be sure to scout your locations. In Death Valley, photographing, I photographed here two shots, so I made the combination. So the first shot is of the foreground, and so that is with the 16 to 35 millimeter at 16 millimeter, and I focus very close, just a few inches into the foreground, and that allows us to get that depth of foreground to background. And then, in addition, there was a crescent moon. So photograph this one at the foreground at f3.5, 30 seconds, ISO 3200, 
with 16 millimeter. Then I left the camera in place as the then moon, crescent moon, went behind the mountains and then the foreground became completely dark. And I took a second shot of the stars. And now the reason I use the 16 millimeters because you get a lot of those circles. 24 you get less, so I like the wider 14, 15, 16 millimeters for photographing the stars as star trails. And then with that, we get the beautiful circles and I photograph for two hours and eight minutes. And then leaving the camera on that entire time. And I also use something called long exposure noise reduction. So I turned that on and the camera took another shot for two hours and eight minutes. So that pretty much was right to the edge of the battery life on that. And then that second shot, what it does is it reduces the noise and it does a great job. And I use the long exposure noise reduction on anything about four minutes or longer. It does a little bit at 30 seconds, but not enough for me to bother to use it. So you'll see a few pixels that will get out, like those red and green pixels will disappear when you use that. But uh, So your choice if you want to use it or not. But anything over four minutes, I definitely use that. Then I combined those two images later in Photoshop and created a layer mask on the bottom. And then that way we have the foreground and the star trails in the background. And the second shot was at f5.6, two hours, eight minutes, ISO 100. And we sat out and watched the stars while we were photographing. Then left after a little while, had dinner, came back and came to find it. And what we uh, found, to find the tripod out in the middle of Death Valley at Badwater, then we photographed, I could put tape on it, so reflective tape, so when I do the flashlight, then I can see it. Um, and some people might use a little light, but I just have a little reflective tape on my tripod so that I can find it later. Another image here with the trees and the trees at twilight, photographing that, and then at night at Mount Rainier, and then I come back and I combine the images in Photoshop layer, and I did select subject and it selected the subject and then I did a, the, with the layer mask and just painted a little in, and then that's how we got the combination of the trees and the twilight and another one with the tree and this is at the bristlecone pines and photographing at twilight now this i don't wait till actually at sunrise because at sunrise the light is just too strong and you know and then when it's actually really bright it doesn't look very real to me the really bright twilight hours and the stars so i like it when it's really moody, really still pretty dark, so that it's totally dark to our eyes. So that's why I got that. And then this with the stars in the middle of the night where we get that deep core Milky Way gases. And then I'm shooting at F1.4, 20 seconds, ISO 200 with the 24 millimeter again. And then I combine them in Photoshop. And then this is the result here. And we have the combination of the foreground element and the background and it just pops and it gives it that mystical kind of magical look so I like that a lot. This is at Lake Tahoe and photographing at twilight and you can see we've got that beautiful light, a little bit of glow on the horizon and the wonderful lake gets the foreground element and some mistiness going on from the wind and the waves and then I photograph that at night and with the shooting star and then I combine those together and this is what happened. So we get this beautiful kind of mystic looking image. You can see more images and read articles about the night photography on my blog at jenniferwu.com with articles on the Milky Way, night sky, lunar eclipse and many more. So another thing is you can check out my book, Photography Night Sky. Many thanks to Canon for sponsoring me. Thanks to B&H. And you can get all of the products that I mentioned there. Live the light, enjoy the night, and create the magic. So go create beautiful images. I hope to see them. You can reach me through my website, and I will join you shortly for the Q&A.